Hello, my name is Megan Worthington and I'm a student at Southwest Baptist University and the research that I conducted was over the analysis of chemical evidence. Two laboratories have been developed for a new forensic chemistry course offering at Southwest Baptist University. The title of this course is Analysis of Evidence. The focus was on developing two laboratories over the summer of 2020, including determination of an accelerant used in an arson case and latent fingerprinting. These two laboratories were selected based on the applicability within the forensic chemistry career field, allowing students to have hands-on experience with evidence collection and sample preparation and analysis. The developed labs will also begin to pique student attentiveness of relating physical and chemical properties, chemical reactions, and instrumentation to forensic evidence collection and analysis. These labs will allow students to have hands-on experience in the scientific field through diverse evidence analysis techniques and real-world applications of chemistry principles. The first lab that was developed was determination of an accelerant used in an arson case. The objectives of this lab were for students to determine, based off of retention times on the gas chromatograph, which accelerant was used to start the fire on samples found at a crime scene. And another objective for students was for them to be able to determine retention times of known accelerants using proper methods with gas chromatography. The procedure that we developed was using residues of acetone, ethanol, methyl ethyl ketone, or mixtures of these accelerants were detected on parts of a bathroom rug, curtains, and clothing. The accelerant detection laboratory procedure focuses on utilizing gas chromatography to determine the accelerant, if any, had been used to start a fire in a simulated arson scenario. Accelerant residues were detectable after one by one inch squares of various materials were doused with 10 milliliters of accelerant and then set on fire. Flames were contained in a fume hood and materials were burned for eight seconds, then put out using a wash bottle. Next, Samples were transferred quickly to a covered vial and heated on a hot plate for an additional five minutes. Finally, a one microliter sample was ejected from the headspace and the sample was analyzed utilizing gas chromatography. Accelerants were then identifiable based on retention times. Results are shown on the next slide. Here is a photo of a gas chromatograph that resulted from testing a sample of a curtain that had been doused in an unknown accelerant and then was extracted utilizing the headspace into the gas chromatograph. This was the readout that was found based off of the known retention time with acetone. We can match this retention time, which was found to be 1.2 to the known retention time of acetone given to students and therefore, the students are able to conclude that the known accelerant that was used in their particular arson case was acetone based off of their ability to read retention times from the GC. Here is another example of a gas chromatograph that resulted from testing a sample of ethanol utilizing the same method as described before with the acetone, but this time it was tested on a bathroom rug. The retention time was found to be 1.18. And this matches the known retention time given in the laboratory procedure for the known accelerants that were given as choices for possible usages in the crime scene. This gas chromatograph can help students conclude that ethanol was used to start the arson and students will be able to find this for different accelerants depending on which ones they were given in their particular case study. 
another lab was developed labeled latent fingerprinting. There were two objectives for this lab. The first objective was for students to be able to successfully lift and analyze fingerprints off of each of the surfaces provided for testing. And the second was for, for students to be able to analyze which methods work for which type of materials. The types of methods that were tested for the latent fingerprinting lab are dusting, ninhydrin, iodine fuming, superglue fuming, and silver nitrate. Each method has optimal surface properties which enables or hinders print retrieval, including smoothness and porosity. Beakers, a calculator case, cardboard, a hammer, manila folders, paper, petri dishes, sheets of tin, soda cans, and a wrench were all analyzed for print retrieval during the research. Prints were able to be lifted using dusting from paper, cardboard, the tin sheet, a petri dish, and a beaker. Successful print retrieval utilizing the ninhydrin method only occurred when lifting from paper. Using silver nitrate solution and a UV light, prints were recovered from paper, a folder, and cardboard. The iodine solution was used to successfully pull prints from paper, a folder, and a hammer. Lastly, and most successfully, prints utilizing the superglue fuming method were able to be lifted from each type of material. There are different methods used to lift prints throughout the research. For dusting, we utilized carbon and a thick makeup brush. This was found to be the most successful procedure. Ninhydrin, it is important for students to make sure to firmly press fingerprints onto surfaces for better collection. Ninhydrin works by reacting with the amino acids that are present in fingerprint residues. Next, for iodine fuming, an apparatus was created utilizing a beaker, watch glass, wire gauze, and material to be tested, and iodine crystals. The iodine fuming worked by the iodine crystals giving off vapors, also called sublimating, which then absorbed physically to the oily substances of a fingerprint. Next, for superglue fuming, we created a fuming chamber utilizing TLC plate chambers, a hot plate, aluminum foil boats, and masking tape to suspend items being tested. Superglue works by reacting with traces of amino acids, fatty acids, and proteins in the latent fingerprint and the moisture in the air to produce a visible sticky white material that forms along the ridges of the fingerprint. Lastly, utilizing the silver nitrate method, this type of apparatus was created utilizing UV lamps, ring stands, and clamps. The silver nitrate works by reacting with the chlorides and skin secretions to form silver chloride, which turns gray when exposed to UV light. However, it is important that developed prints be photographed immediately because the reaction will eventually fade into the background. In the future, this research will be used in order to be added to a laboratory manual full of other procedures utilized in this forensic chemistry course. Other procedures need to be researched further, including running DNA to identify a suspect and even being able to identify unknown white powders at crime scene. This research was able to help us identify certain methodology necessary for success and will make the creation of this course stronger and also help students gain a stronger understanding of forensic chemistry. I would like to acknowledge Sigma Zeta for granting me this opportunity to pursue my research in the chemistry field. I would also like to thank Dr. Danielle West for providing me with the chance 
to be a part of Southwest Baptist undergraduate research experience in the summer of 2020 and teaching me all of the things that she has throughout my research experience. Thank you so much for your time. 